okay, if it wasn't raw, you wouldn't like it. So here we are. Uh, you don't get the good mic today because I need power for this thing because it was down to like 20 some odd percent. This is the iPad, the iPhone, the iPod I had that I used to talk to you on. SoundCloud doing the processing of our audio verite. The Zeph report uh, has been uh, dropped once and stripes across the stream. Okay, so I think there's a guarantee on that. Uh, uh, on the the uh, iPad itself, I have a military style case called the Survivor by Griffin, and it's uh, guaranteed to withstand any, any drop at all. It just looks like something you'd have in a Desert Storm or whatever. Oh, I'm sorry. In the new upcoming war that we we will be starting presently, uh, it doesn't matter, friends. I know what you're thinking. I'm going to pull up a chair here and talk to you. I'm on a mix right now, so I have to... The studio is really busy. We're, we got uh, like three or four projects backed up in a row. And uh, <clears throat> I'm really excited about this rap project we're doing called uh, In Sanitarium by a young uh, man from the hood down in Dallas. Uh... You know, it's so funny us working together because he's like from, you know, from the authentic hip-hop guy, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I'm, I'm this old crazy guy up in New Mexico, and we get along great. You know, we're, we're, we're banging it out. I have him come into the studio via Skype, and uh, he can see everything. He can see the, uh, he can see the effects we're doing, and then, then he's very concerned about his voice being right because he, he, he mixes his voice like... You know, the same style as like a Jay-Z or any of these other, you know, uh, rappers. There's a, there's a certain technique which, um, that I'm honoring, you know, what I'm, what I'm there to do is serve the song. I'm not there to put my, uh, what I want to do is bring it out, out the, the vision that he had for the song, you know, the, the whole concept of the song. And that's how I like to work with artists. I like to serve the music. I don't like, if they want me to do something, like come in and do some of my razzle-dazzle stuff and, you know, it, it, it impacted in some way. Uh, I'm very, th that's fine too. But in this case, it's, uh, uh, I had to add w one bass line, which I did via, I was going to get a friend to do it, and then I thought, well, it's not really that difficult, and I have a, a Moog Sub Fatty sitting here, which is arguably one of the best bass synths in, in the world because that's really what it what it does best and this kind of music you know electronic rap hip hop you know all that it does that very well so I I use that and uh interesting uh key key of a nice nice piano chords nice strings a uh, nice beat I may have to replace the snare but basically we're building it up and you know today I got to get it done okay so uh but we're all we're all the way to the point of being um of mixed in other words we're to the point of being able to now mix. So all the sounds are kind of nailed. We've, you know, we worked on his, uh, his the most important thing is the voice. And, um, you know, with rappers you get, you get like three tracks or six tracks or 12 tracks, but they all have one thing in common. There's a center, left and right, and you know, something different goes on in the left and the right, and then you have the center. So it's a big, so when the, when the, when the rap, kicks in and you hear the voice, it's a big voice. It's huge. Not like rock and not like, uh, you know, just any other kind of music. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a certain style, a certain sound. He's able to achieve it uh, with his vocal production and then, and then what we're doing here is bringing it out all the way. So it's, a, so it's as, just like any record you would hear. So it's been fun, but I mean, I need, that's what's awaiting me uh, my best mixing time is about 3.30, I'd say, anywhere from about 3 on. I'd, I'd rather sleep in a way, but usually when I sleep, I don't get anything done, so I uh, was in bed early, so this is not, you know, a sacrifice of any, of any kind, but uh, there's a lot of other things going on. Anyway, I'm chiming in here because, you know... I give you play-by-play play of what's going on there in the uh, 
studio because it's kind of you know it gets busy from time to time and then it's you know it's really I really have to prioritize but I you know so that's kind of an update on what's going on there hopefully we'll be able to do an interview and you know I'll be able to bring you into the process a little bit and and show you <clears throat> kind of like what I'm trying to do and and naturally you'll 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 hear the end result but this is going to be like a demo for him to uh get out there with and he's a on fire Christian very I don't think he'd be acceptable to any church. I mean, he's very hardcore. He goes by the name of the AOD. I mean, I thought I was the AOD, <clears throat> and then there was a euphemistic name, meaning that I was so... <laughs> but I, I'm sorry. I have to relinquish that, that title to the real AOD, which is this kid from, uh, from Dallas uh, named Eduardo, and he's, uh, he's the AOD. So his, his rap is very strong. And it's a warning, you know, it's a, like like a prophetic warning uh, about people that diss the Lord, people that think they're going to turn away from the Lord and see, here it comes. We're, 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 yeah, gosh, I'm ragtagged. I don't know if I'm going to wake up today. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, uh... Folks, you're... <clears throat> uh, I'm all stuffed up. You're, uh, you're getting me at, at like, the, the rawest time. Anyway, I had a conversation with a sister yesterday of someone who's been listening and it's on the same path. And woke up a couple of years ago to understanding, you know, the gang stalking aspect of persecution. And it can be really horrifying, you know. I mean, I've been consciously awake since I was a teenager and um, have been persecuted since that, you know, I mean, uh, you know, overtly in very weird, you know, I would say it's, it looks on the surface like street theater, like a bunch of people that don't know each other coordinating uh, some kind of a uh, theatrical attack on you in public. You know what I mean? And, or, and it, usually it always has the same theme to, to scare you, to drive you to um, uh, feel isolated, to drive you to feeling all alone, and if, if possible to drive you to suicide and or to drive you crazy, to drive you into a mental institution or something along those lines. Uh, and in my case, they would also, there was another aspect of it, a murder aspect, which was like dousing the car with gasoline. And you know what I mean? Maybe it didn't light up right then, but it could have. You know, the, the, there's been a lot of my friends that died from those kind of accidents where they didn't become um, a Satanist, so... Their peer group gang stalked them, right? And then they had an unfortunate accident. What used to be their friends now became their enemy, but instead of being their enemy overtly, they would act like, yeah, we're palsy wowsy, we're best friends. And then they'd be setting them up for a sacrifice because the youngest Satanist on the earth uh, must learn that it's a sacrificial cult. In other words, you must. If you're if you've got someone who's not in on the inside, then you must set them up for a sacrifice at very least ruin their life, and that's where the motivation for <clears throat> official gang stalking goes. There is no such thing as a gang stalker that is not a Satanist. Let me repeat that. There is no such thing as a gang stalker who is not a structural Satanist. By that I mean you know, operating in the satanic matrix in the hive mind and, um, you know, being at their rank and file because it's a slave cult. So everyone is a slave and then you become a master over certain people, but you're a slave to others. And it's a pecking order like that. There is not one, and there never has been one, involved in gang stalking that is not a structural, technical Satanist. Let me make that clear for jo Dr. John Hall, and, uh, and others who have been involved in, um, with uh, uh, electronic warfare, psychotronic warfare, and, uh, uh, you know, he's, he hasn't been involved, he's been a guy exposing it, but uh, uh, Duncan, uh, Robert Duncan, and anybody else out there who thinks for some reason this phenomenon called electronic stalking, organized stalking, uh, technological stalking, um, is not a, if they don't understand, it's a multi-dimensional supernatural and natural 
phenomenon that is orchestrated from not this world, like it tried to say in the movie called The Game with Michael Douglas. They had like a room where everyone was organizing the, the game, and they were gaming someone. They were stalking Sean Penn, and they were, or not Sean Penn, I mean, Sean Penn was stalking his brother and organizing all these people to stalk him as part of a game for this company that does these life-changing games. It was all about him awakening and taking his place, and well, you know what I mean. Uh, it was a, <clears throat> the movie was quite literal, quite blatant, and I would have thought, I thought back then, that wow, this will wake a lot of people up when they see this movie. Do not count on it. The sheep, the dumb sheeple and the lamb, they stay dumb. When I say lambs, I don't want to confuse that with lambs of God. Uh, not to be confused with the band lambs of God, lamb of God that is part of the satanic music network. Um... Well, I don't think they would mind my saying that, do you? I mean, what, why are we beating around the... Why be shy now? We're at the end of everything. This is it, buddy. This is, at the very least, you're looking at a great Yahweh judgment upon man. You know, and I'm... I hate to say it, but uh, this is itoldyouso.com. We've been warning about this for a long time, but we also had a message that for God's lambs, you know... You, many of you, are getting through this uh, by the grace of God, by the miracle of God. I feel like I need to go to the Word here, and uh, so I'm going to dial it in. And uh, what we want to do is we want to go to uh, Isaiah, and we are going to go to... Uh, Way down, Isaiah is a huge book, and we're going to go to 49, uh, chapter 49. The Lord gave this to me. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him who, whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. <clears throat> anyway, you know who you are if you're cho chosen, and, and and the Holy One of Israel is really the, those people the Lord has chosen. No, so that's how you have to read it, because otherwise you'd be you'd be looking at it in a one-dimensional way. Uh, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, "Go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves." They shall feed in the ways, and their pastors shall be in all the high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst; neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinim. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. And this is the, this is the word I was trying to give you, but I was drowned out, ladies and gentlemen, by the incredible amount of negative news and end of the world stuff and, and all this, this I, I drowned out, I drowned, just drowned out, okay, and then the Lord says, can a woman forget her sucking child and should and that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee, thus saith the Lord, people. Come on. Come on, stop it, will you? Will you listen to what the Lord is saying to you? For, please drop your baggage, drop your history, drop your conception of yourself, and listen. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, and these gather themselves together and, and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all. 
as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride doeth. For, for, for thy waste and thy desolate places, the land of thy destruction, shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants, that they may be swallowed, they, that, that, and, that, and they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. The children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other shall say again in thine ears, The place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone, and these, where had they been? Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and their daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. A lot of people coming in. You hear that Babylon? Those captives in the um, in the businesses of entertainment are going to come out, and they've got to. There's a lot of them awake. They know everything I'm saying. It's just that they feel jaded because they, you know, they feel ashamed because rather than remaining pure, they went the dark way, the way of the world, and got their brass ring, and of course it's a, we realize they were slaves, and have been plotting, of what, wondering, of what, you know, praying to get out ever since, to find a way to make it all work out, and folks, it doesn't work out. It's very hard for someone to leave, you know, where, where there's been, uh, where they've hit the jackpot. But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. Period. Now this is a word that is uh, was meant for the time, the prophecy of Isaiah, but it's meant for you now, because the Lord gave me that. For you. And uh, one hopes that, you know, in the process of uh, receiving a word, that you might rejoice rather than be so concerned. There's nothing you can do about it anyway. Yeah, the world is going to do what it's going to do. It's at a kind of a tipping point right now. But, <clears throat> you know, I'm, here I am, the fool, right? I'm just calm in the midst of the storm. I'm continuing to mix away in my studio as if there's, you know, as if it, as if the people that I'm working with are just going to go out. They got their whole lives ahead of them, you know, in this case with the AOD. And he's going to go out and, you know, tear it up for the Lord. He's, he's, he's basically, I just love this guy. He's, his spirit is pure fire. He's like a, he really is the angel of death. That's what we call him, the AOD. And um, he basically is saying, you know, those of you, I'll just paraphrase what I'm working on. And hopefully I can bring you in there at some point, maybe today. Basically, you who turned away from God, you who dissed my Lord, you who uh, sought to kill the people of my God around the world, we have brothers and sisters, you who chose to persecute me for prophesying the truth about the churches and about the business of religion, you will have your day. You will have a day of contention that you have not ever even imagined. But the people whom you spat upon, who claim to be brethren but you said no, they will continue on. You people that have been uh, on, the, on the tit of the whore of Babylon, you've been cut off. And the Lord is saying to you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have the world and the Lord. You have to make a decision. 
But if you keep on the way you're going, you will be judged along with the, with the uh, wicked and cut down just like um, a clear cutting of forest. You will be cut down and that will be the end of you. And that day could be any day. Any day. They're getting ready to launch a plethora of diseases. You know, last year I almost died. I, I guess I was targeted with some kind of disease. I, it wasn't contagious, but it was a deadly flu. Symptoms. And I couldn't breathe. You, 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 some of you heard me on the, on the, on the air here. And uh, I, I came uh, later to learn it killed a lot of people. It, the news media blacked it out. Uh, anyone that had it was sick for over a month. We, in this case, it was about two months. And um, barely made it. Uh, oh, and uh, if you took a flu vaccine, then you're more likely to die. Okay, that to me seems like weaponized flu. Okay. Um, and they tried to launch it again. I actually had two of them. And it was, the second one was weaker. And then now, and now it's dissipated because it, if it's cooked up in a laboratory as a weapon, it tends to mutate weaker and weaker. Like the, the last thing about the uh, Arab disease or whatever, the Arab flu, whatever that was. The, uh, I don't know what they call it, the mirrors or whatever they were, they were saying it was. Um, uh, they came from the Middle East. You, you notice they, they attempted to weaponize it, I believe. And what happened is um, it did what it always did. It just it came to the United States and they were saying people had, but then it dissipated, it weakened. And that's what happened to SARS. <clears throat> and that's what happened to the, when it's weaponized, it weakens faster. So, I mean, people that get it die, but then it weakens and then the whole population didn't get it, which was the hope of last year. The, the idea is they want to use the flu, the mass death, to then clear the way to bring in, I told you this years ago in, in a prophesying, that they would get rid of the people here, better to do it through flu and disease than, than, um, than bombs, so that the foreigners would come in and they would take over. And I said that if the nation didn't repent, this is what would happen, um, whether it be the Chinese or this influx we have now, but the people that were here before won't be here in the future. And that was the vision that I had. In 2002, three around in there, and I shared it with you. I said, Lord, show me the destruction of America is just basically foreigners coming in and taking over, and they're the owners, they're the people going to the jobs, they're the ones, and the people that were here before have been cast out by the Lord. Now, the Lord's using Obama and using all this stuff to do it, but it's a fulfillment of prophecy, so I'm not surprised, amen. This was a word that I had and I gave to you. And I explained very accurately, this is what you'll see. This is the way judgment looks. And it makes sense that they wouldn't want to destroy everything, you know, say with nukes and whatnot, because they would want to exchange and bring in all these other people and they would be the ones in the houses. And this has happened before. It happened with the Babylonian captivity. Well, in this case, it's not captivity. It's the eradication of people by use of uh, plagues. And last year we had a, a taste of it, and that's what they keep trying to do. They're, they're going to try to bring back some kind of plague again. And it's all in the news. And, um, you know, the idea is to, to, to weaken the people here, to have them die off. And that's why they poison the water and the food and everything else. Um, you know, light poison, you know, toxins and things, you know, so that, so that the people will be sick, die off, and then make room for this influx. And that was the judgment of the Lord. Make no mistake, that is a judgment of Yahweh himself. Because he gave that to me in an impossible prediction where everybody else is saying gloom and doom. Everyone else is doing this whole other dance, song and dance. But this came from him, and then now, look, it's accurate. That he, at least we know this. That is the plan. Right? The plan is to do just what they're doing now. And that would be the North American Union, which has also been on the books with the Trilateral Commission for all those years. But that the people here who were here before won't be here in the future, which is why they teach Chinese and, and other languages, like up in the um, upper Midwest schools in uh, Michigan and so forth, they're teaching Chinese and, and having more and more Chinese because that's the Chinese are going to end up running all that. And that's the plan to get rid of you.
because you know they want to get rid of you because they have this vision of a new world order, you know, a global governance, a global order where everyone, where the people here are willing slaves and they all agree and they all go Zeke Heil, all right? So and anyone who doesn't gets killed. So we just have only, you know, mindless drone sycophant idiots here and uh, useful idiots. And, you know, useless to everybody, useless to themselves, useless to the world, useless to the Lord, useless to anybody. Simply useless garbage bags uh, walking around feeding themselves, thinking they have a life. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people are, are, you know, kind of almost fitting in that category right now. They actually believe they have some sort of life here. Um, it's sad. It really is. It's like if Truman and the Truman Show decided, uh, you know, even though I know that's a fake wall out there, and even though I know this is fake, you know what? I got three meals a day. I got to, I'm just going to cool it and not try to get out of here. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to try to find out what they did to me. I'm just going to sit here on the movie set they built for me and enjoy it. And, and the Lord says, fine, then you will be removed from the land. And I will replace you with these other people who will work much harder, much younger, uh, coming from China, coming from South America, Central America, coming from wherever they're coming from, and I will move them in. And they will live in your houses, and they will work in your factories, and they will be the people of America. Period. Now, you see it coming due that the use of flu and the use of terror soon to come. We have Dick Cheney now warning there'll be an attack worse than 9-11. So that's the neocon point of view. And that's uh, basically, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're going forward, okay, with all this. The whole point being, you know, and as I look at America, I, I'm, I'm like, good, you people deserve it, you know? That's kind of how I feel. When I look at the church system, it's like, you people just, you know what, the only thing that's going to wake you up is something like this. Because they're still sound asleep. They're, they're the, you know, it's funny, the churches are the last people to wake up. They claim to be awake. You know, they have a taste of the word. They have a form of religion, but not the spirit thereof, as the Bible says. So, you know, um, I just find that to be, you know, incredible. They th you think you're saying, me and Pete, uh, We've been saved. Um, yeah, I just saw that movie the other day. Boy, what a great movie that is. I'll take the Cone Brothers Film Festival over anything because that just cracks me up. Just cracks me up as they mock, you know, the South and religion and all the other stuff. It's a mockery, but it's just it's brilliant, you know. So I'm... Now, the kingmakers of the world, the uh, sisterhood... They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord has not sent them. And they made others to hope that they would confirm the word. They have not seen a vain vision, and they have not spoken a lying divination, whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And this is, we have this as well going on. Uh, and this is the, uh, let, let's, let's go further into the sisterhood that runs this thing. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies and shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am Lord God, because even, and even because uh, they have seduced my people, saying peace where there is no peace, and built up on a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar, See unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and you, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it, whatever they build. Lo, so when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith you have daubed it? And it didn't hold, did it? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury will consume it. So I will break down the wall that you have daubed it with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof. You shall know that I am the Lord. 
Thus I will accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her, when there is no peace, saith the Lord God. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. Yes, the sisterhood. And say, Thus saith Lord God, Woe unto the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? Which is a sexual term, actually, in the Hebrew. And will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread and slay the souls that should not die to save the souls alive that should not live? By your lying to my people that hear your lies. We're talking about prophetesses in this case and, and false prophets. Wherefore, thus saith Lord God, behold, I'm against your pillows wherewith you hunt the souls to make them fly or blossom, i.e. Uh, structural Satanism. And I will tear them, you know, while prophesying that this is the Lord and it's really the devil. Uh, and I will tear them from your arms and let the souls go, even the souls that you use to make them fly. Another word for fly in the Hebrew there is blossom to make the soul blossom, to potentiate the power in that soul so they can become a king or whatever. Behold into this circle of, of sewing women. Get the picture? It's been this way for thousands of years. You might as well know how it runs, how the world works. That's how it works. That's how it works. Nobody becomes president or whatever without their... Well, this is the first time we see some of the sisterhood in the actual halls of power. We see them there, but usually they're behind the scenes and they promote the men who become kings and whatever. And they, and they also uh, promote the, you know, the pre preachers or whatever the religion is. And they prophesy wonderful things about you know, the new world order and how there will be peace after this conflict and how the Lord is... Oh, here's the one I love. This is like the Kim Clement School of Prophecy. How the Lord is um, you know, really blessing all these souls, you know, that, that, that you better get in and invest now because, boy, times, you're not going to catch this again. This is going to be the greatest boom of all time. And they have this, this outlook, which, which we know that never, <clears throat> look, last year I could have died. So as far as I was concerned, we have the prophecy, well, the Lord pulled me through, I mean, miraculously, because I shouldn't be here right now. I mean, that was as bad as any other trauma I've had in my life, but I didn't, I didn't make a big deal out of it, you know, because I was at peace, right? <clears throat> but it was close, folks. So that could have been my end right there. The Lord would have just pulled me out of here. I'd be going home with him. Or you could say, well, no, that's a judgment against you because you've been prophesying against the churches. No, I'm not prophesying against the churches. I'm saying if a church is found to be in Satan structurally and claims to be of Jesus structurally, that the truth is always that they're in Satan structurally, but not with Jesus structurally. That is the truth, and that is the only thing I've said. And then, you know, it, it seems that the preponderance of these institutions um, have gone to the devil of long, long, long time ago, way before I ever got on the scene. I don't have any vested interest. I got no... When you, when you say that to people, they say, oh, you're so hateful. It's like you have a vendetta. I have no vendetta. I want you all to, to succeed. I'm just saying, technically, there's a legal issue here. And I've gone about it like that. I don't have any, I don't hang around people of the churches. I don't find we have anything in common. So there's no point for me to, to interact other than to, to say what the Lord says to them, to speak truth to power, the church's power. I, you might not realize that they're very powerful. Even a small evangelical church has power and thousands and, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars flowing through it, you know. So, you know, it's powerful, okay? It's sanctioned by the state via 501c3. And um, they're, they're just like the uh, above-ground churches in China that George Bush went to when he went to the Olympics. And uh, that's who they are. The underground church, uh, Mr. Bush would not talk about that's really on fire. And if you get caught in that, then they just kill you and your family. But they have official churches you can go to. Well, that's what we have here. All I'm saying is it is what it is. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm way beyond the emotion of it. I'm like, hey, look, 
you have free will, you do what you want to do. They want to get into like a fight with you, like, like they want to prove they're, they're really for real. I've run into people like this, and then they want to call you a liar, they want to call you a Satanist, they want to do all this stuff to defend themselves. They go so far out of their way to defend themselves that they look guilty. Have you ever had that experience? Well, I get that all the time. You know, like emails of, you know, well, you said this and you said that, and it's like, it's not true. We're a good people. You know what I mean? And then they just walk away from you like old friends I've had. They just walk away. How dare you say such a thing? How dare I say such a thing? Because it's the truth. That's how dare I say such a thing. Now back to the gang stalking. There is no such thing as a gang stalker that is not a structural Satanist. I'm going to say it again and again. Until you people wake up and realize that going to meetings and talking about satellites and uh, implantable chips and all that stuff, which is all there, uh, admittedly, of course. It's, uh, the, uh, all that's there. All the technological pieces are there. The military aspect of it's there. But I'm saying, it, you know, it is what it is. The, the, and, and the people that participate, they might say, they might even believe they're atheists, but they are structural Satanists. Because the point is, is that the target is a sacrificial lamb. It, all, it becomes a sacrifice unto the Lord Satan, Okay. Understand that. Even if they claim ignorance on the subject, that's what they are. That's who they are. That's how God sees them, and that's how they're going to be punished. They're going to burn in hell. Um, it gives me kind of a, 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 a pleasure because I, um, I know there's a punishment. And I, I know it, it's kind of like the, the, you get punished, but then you get extinguished. Like you never get another chance or, if, you know, uh, maybe it's kind of like the, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, we've all speculated about what happens at death, but the Lord woke me up one night about two weeks ago and he showed me all these people in like, <clears throat> you know how you have a, an office of cubicles and phones, like in a sales office. And uh, so there, everyone was in, in their own cubicle and they were burning, flames were, were going up in each cubicle. Yet they were, they were having to withstand it. And the Lord said, make no mistake, son, this is real. So I, I guess I had maybe speculated even that it may not be real, maybe an extinguishment. I got my answer, no. This burning in hell is real. Hellfire is real. I said, but it seems so hokey, Lord. It seems so comic bookish. I know it's in the Bible and everything, the lake of fire and all that, but you know, the, but the lake of fire is metaphorical. It's true. It's a way of explaining that it's a punishment, a, a terrible punishment. But here's what else I saw. I was actually taken there and I saw them burning and each, each one having his own like karmic debt to pay, burning. And um, all of them wanted out and between them there was no love, no hope, no God, no prayer, nothing. Just suffering. Just punishment. And I, so I, you know, maybe I'm remiss that I didn't tell you right away. I just, you know, I've been exploring the time. I guess I had time, I had time to confirm the word, but I've confirmed that that's, that's real. And it, it's confirmed by other people who've had near-death experiences and they've seen both hell and heaven. They've seen what happens after death. And they've lived to tell about it and they've given their testimony. So I'm just chiming in on their side saying, well, I've had a confirmation that the hellfire is really real. That the punishment's really real. I don't know how long it goes. You know, I, I also know this. The people of God aren't really conscious of it because all we're going to be conscious of, you know, our, our Lord, you know, takes away all the memories of everything. So we don't have any memory of what happened. We don't even have any memory of this. We just are, if you will in another dimension, but we just are. And we are, we are body and soul, but in a multidimensional aspect, which is, which is impossible to imagine. So let's just put it, you know, people try to imagine that we'll be, you know, back here and bones jump up and run around and we get to live on forever while everything lives and dies around us. No, that's, that's, that's ridiculous as well. But this idea of burning, of hellfire, that what Jesus talked about, what the Old Testament you know, um, kind of hinted at, didn't really go into, I mean, it, it, not as much as the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus references it many times, and of course, the, the ultimate Jesus document is the book of Revelation, where it's very explicit about the, the twice dead, 
And the way you get to be twice dead is you give your soul to Satan, and at some point in that process, the you who you were isn't there anymore in the vessel. So you're twice dead. That's, that's the easiest way I can explain it. Okay, um, you, you're, you, you're dead spiritually, but you're also dead physically because you're not there in your body like you were. So that's a twice dead situation. You're dead. Anyway, um, but the twice dead have, will be um, as souls or will be. Somehow, I, I don't believe the souls go on with the aliens and they have it in a box and they, I think these souls are called the judgment and there is a reintegration at some point. Usually when people get to be older, a lot of times they reintegrate with their souls because, they, because the other side's done with them, right? You need something in there or you, you, just, you're, you just collapse in death. Anyway, that's an area of speculation as to how, but, but when they are burning, they are consciously in their spirit, soul, form, whatever. They are consciously aware of everything, so they must be intact. Otherwise, the punishment would be meaningless. And that's as far as I've gotten on it. I can't give you any more details. I just saw them in each one in his own cubicle, which to me means each one with his own set of deeds, his own identity, being personally dealt with with flames of hell. And I know it seems like a comic book. I mean, I got in trouble when I was talking about um, Obama being a, a prodigal of some sort. And, um, but the Lord corrected me on that and said, but a prodigal still has a, you know, maybe he should come home, but he might not, you know. So I, I just, you know, I don't even know what to think about with him. I just, at this point, I'm beginning to really feel sorry for him because... Well, there is no him. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. They talk about twice dead. If you want to see twice dead, all you got to do is just watch the uh, television, watch these people, watch Hillary Clinton or him or any of these people, Dick Cheney or any of them. They're all, you know, basically, um, although Cheney looks a little worried. Uh, he, he actually, to me, he looks like he's somewhat intact. He's not, you know, he's, he's intact and he's dreading dying. You know, Lord knows what he's got to answer for. I wouldn't want to be in the industri military industrial complex down that rabbit hole as you know, far as some of these people have gone. And, you know, getting back is a bitch, right? But we'll see. Anyone can repent. And so I hope these, all these people do. I have actually no malice. I just realized that there's nobody in the pulpits, pretty much nobody. These days, they're even lighter than they were before. They're blaming it. They're talking about the New World Order and stuff, a lot more. But they're blaming it on other people like, we in here, we're good. And them out there, they're bad. Well, I think the Lord wants to deal with all of us. You know, if this thing hits America and it goes down, um, then the people here are being punished by God for turning away from God and for all manner of depravity that they've looked the other way on and the harming of innocent people and the harming of children because they're structural Satanists. In the main, the majority. Not a cult. Not a few people here and there that we have to kind of map them out. No. In toto e toto, the whole thing. With, you know, let me give you the picture of the way it is in America. It's a block, a junta of Satanists with a few lambs running around here and there, holding up, holding the dam from breaking. Without the lambs, the dam would have already broken. They'd all be dead. Because if you kill the lambs, there's, as they're trying to do in, um, in the Middle East right now, uh, that means there would be no reason for them to live. Once you've killed them, then there's no more purpose in you living. The only reason that life is allowed to go on here is because of God's lambs. Without them, there's no reason for God to sustain this world. None. Zero. There is no life without God. These people live at the pleasure or because the lambs survive. These people are able to have their silly, perverted little civilization at the, at, because God wants his lambs, he's, He's doing a work in them and they need to walk through this world and be affected by it for a, a certain result. And that is why the other people are allowed to live and carry on as if they're the boss. That's the thing that kills me. They're the boss. 
they think they're in charge. A guy like David Rockefeller felt that he was in charge and he's going to divvy up the world the way he wants. Or the Bilderbergers, or they think they're in charge. Anyone who has money as their God is a structural Satanist, by the way. Anyone who claims to be an atheist is a structural Satanist. There is, <laughs> I just want to be clear on what that term means. You can say you're an atheist all you want. It just means you're, you know, you've, you've rejected God. That's all it means. And that you would be a, one of Satan's brood. Part of the family. Oh, you've realized, of course, that you have worldly acceptance, do you not? Certain doors are open for you that wouldn't be open just for anybody. You're on the inside. You're a structural Satanist, even if you don't go to any rituals, you don't do anything. When people, when you see the game whirling around, it's spooky and supernatural, isn't how, how things come and go, how people just die here and there and around and have, you know, where it goes, nobody knows, right? And you just watch this spooky thing, you keep your head down and you shut up and just try to do, do you know, make sure that no one gets mad at you and you, you, you keep your, your stuff straight, right? You're going to burn. But before you do, you're going to see all this fall apart. Everything you worked for fall apart. Everything that you thought you were fall apart. I mean, I'm, I'm just waiting for the suicides to begin, you know? Right? And then they got the DHS and everybody else, FEMA and everybody else to lock her up. So anyone who wants to complain about uh, whatever will not be able to. Now, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying this future has to be. Because this is, I think everybody is thinking along these lines. I'm saying that if you people don't uh, wake up, this fate will surely befall you because the, the, the rulers are not your friends. They're not going to take care of you. They just need useful idiots. And once they get what they want, uh, they don't need you anymore. So, so you know, you're going to find a lot of lambs of God. Now, my excitement is that there's so many people waking up and coming to the Lord. You know, maybe may because they ran, you know, they just, they lost their families, their wives, their families are breaking up now at a record pace because of the, 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 the stress and strain of the change on a, undergoing this weak excuse for a civilization. There's great change going on, great stress. American people have been targeted to, for eviction and they can feel it and they're upset. And uh, regardless of however they vote, Whatever they do, this thing keeps marching on lawlessly, and Obama can't do anything about it. He, he actually he didn't he just goes and plays golf while it all goes on. He's you know he, he, no one's going to do anything about it. No one's going to defend the law. Congress is is useless. They can't pass any laws that stick. Um, nobody knows where this thing is coming from and where it's going. It's out of control, a runaway train. But is it? No, it's all been planned, everything you see. And it's going according to plan. The real people who are your rulers, oh, America, are doing what they want to do in plain sight. And there's nothing you can do about it because you do not have a republic and you do not have a democracy. Thank you. Realize that. Maybe if you were willing to fight for it, which you're not, they know you're all pussies. So basically they're going to just come and take it. When I say all pussies, I mean the preponderance of people are cowards, not the land of the home of the brave. I mean, I think the men and women in the military that go in and arrive, they're very brave, and you know, there's, there's still bravery here. But in the main, the main bulk are afraid of death, and that makes them cowards. Now, to not be afraid of death, you must have the Lord. If you have the Lord, then like when I, how I was at peace facing my own death, um, and no one would know about it. I would just have passed on and that would have been the end of it. But I was okay. I could face it. I didn't have to be a coward. I didn't have to run from it or be scared. Now, without the Lord, I'd be a coward because I'd be afraid to, well, I wouldn't speak to you. Are you kidding me? Going out on the internet and uh, talking about this subject where you could get, you know, because I've, I've had my share, man. I've had, I've had um, besides last year, and then <laughs> sabotaging my vehicles and, um, poisoning of food and then, you know, um, all, many near death experiences due to what I'm doing on the internet. But the Lord won't tolerate my being scared. So I have to buck up and I just got to go, okay, Lord, you got to just walk me through this. 
I don't want to talk on the internet anymore, but then I have a, you know, I don't want to just go out there waving a big sign. You know, who does? But if I don't do it, I'm just afraid of the Lord, that I would be out of favor, or that, you know, the Lord wouldn't, you know, I just want him to use me. I, I, I don't want to be doing this on my own. I need him. You know, that's the thing. Uh, you know, without his guiding hand, life has no meaning. Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out, and how are the things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. And they that eat bread shall have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau and thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee and thou shalt be cut off forever. Shall be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into the gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them, but thou should have not have looked on the day of thy brother. In the day that he became a stranger, neither should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither should thou have spoken proudly of the day of distress. Thou should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of the calamity, of their calamity, yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity and have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity, neither should thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape, neither should thou have delivered up those um, <clears throat> of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. In other words, you see the people being persecuted and cut off. Uh, <clears throat> they're doing it for their side. Structural Satanists, thank you. <laughs> so they're doing it for their side, and they're cheering on, hey! And, and some of them think they've got God's favor. Hey, look, we're slaying our enemies finally. Thank you, Lord. Lord's saying, you should never, you are the heathen. Just because I've dealt with my people in this way, I've allowed a certain amount of slaughter, I've done this. And remember, there's another side to it. He allows us because it's, it's, it's building the church. I, and it's, it's bizarre, but that, that's the thing it is. But, you know, I've allowed this to happen, but you, heathen, shouldn't be celebrating over it like you have my favor or like I'm weak because I have allowed it, thus saith the Lord. Right, and this had to do with all the with the whole you know distress of you know you know Esau and Jacob, okay, and and you know uh, Jacob, I love Esau, I hate, and the, the house of Esau, the house of Jacob, the, the you know the house of Judah, and all that, and all the trouble. Now we're in the time of Jacob's trouble, so I think it's only appropriate to bring this topic up. Right, the great tribulation is the <clears throat> is Jacob's trouble, so. And we're in some kind of tribulation, are we not? I mean, you'd have to be, you'd have to be, uh, I don't know, pretty Disneyland out to really, I, I don't know how you get, get around it. Okay, so. Uh, and they shall possess the Mount of Esau, 
and they have the uh, they have the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. Okay, so this is the dealing with the. Um, and let me let me get to the next. Um, uh, let me get to the next thing. Where is my? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, now that should have stood the cross. So you shouldn't be celebrating that that the Lord is you know seems to take sides and whatnot. Um, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, you hear that, UN. So shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink. The right, they're whooping it up now. They're cutting heads off now. They shall swallow down. And they shall be as though they had not been. They will be removed from the earth. They will be as if, as if though they had never been. Now that's what they're really scared of. I think that's why it's in the Lord's word in that way that they shall be as if they've never been because that's really what, you know, the structural... Um, um, sycophants uh, upon the earth they're, they're worried about two things Hold on. they're worried about getting old right they're terrified of death right right they've been going they, so they go along to get along see no evil hear no evil speak no evil they, they, they keep their mouths shut and, 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 and just live with it and um and when, when the enemy, the, you know, go, goes their way, like I can hear them screaming, well, you conservative Christians, look, you're getting your heads cut off and you're being vilified by the IRS and all you libertarians, people who want liberty, people who have intact, you know, I believe are all God-fearing. Well, well, we all will be in the end. I'm, I'm not worried about you at all. You're never going to be able to hold on to your atheism, buddy. <laughs> I guarantee it. It's just that the Lord hasn't touched you yet because there's a whole life that you know nothing about at this point. But you, it's getting harder and harder to keep your own mind and keep yourself as your own God. And what point is there to even get up in the morning if, if, if you're you, really? Think about it. What are you going to go accomplish? You're going to die. What are you going to do? <laughs> what, what great thing, what great sandcastle are you going to make today? It's going to be washed away when the tide comes up. So what are you going to do? What's the point? And when you get to that point of sheer depression and suicidal thoughts, then maybe, hopefully, on that day, the Lord will break through the, your you know, self-absorbed malaise and he will lift you up and you will never be the same, period, end of story. Beautiful, I love it. I, Lord, I pray that for all our peeps and everyone who listens in here. I pray that blessing. I don't want to see people punished if they don't have to be. But I, I have to read the Lord's word. He, he'll use, you know, he'll allow these Muslims, let's say, to lop the heads off these people just for being Christian or just for being um, something they're not, just for not seeing it their way, which is wrong. Okay, it's wrong. It's not the will of God. But God will allow it a certain amount of that. And then when they start celebrating like they think they have God's favor, they will be as if they've never been. He will, he, it, it, what I've read today here is, and I know it applied back then in the Babylonian captivity and the, you know, the, the conflict between Esau and Jacob, which is the conflict between spirit, carnality, and spirit, Satan and God. Satanists and children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God versus structural Satanists or gang stalkers. All gang stalkers, every last one, who plays that game is a structural Satanist and has been marked for death and marked for destruction. And they, they're allowed to go on for a while, but you know, they're tagged. If they hear this podcast, they're tagged. Tagged means that you're, you know, you're suddenly aware of what you're doing. It means that your friends, okay, here's a guy being tagged. Okay. Oh, look at that idiot over there. Let's go get him. Hey, idiot, you're an idiot. Oh, really? 
I'm sorry, I was just trying to do a good job. No. You know, you're going to have to pay a fine to get through here. You know, that sort of thing, right? Um, you know, you know the bullies. You understand. Think of the Book of Eli movie with Denzel Washington. What a great movie. You know, the public didn't really like it, but I really, I, I, I'm just, oh, I'm, I just need desperately movies like that. But um, I'd rather see that than The Son of God, okay? The Son of God was terrible, terrible movie. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, if you don't do Jesus right, you've got to do it. If you're going to do Jesus, he's gotta, you, can, you can't be politically correct. You, can, you can't be middle of the road. I mean, it made a lot of money. But it's like that, you know, uh, those people, what they don't understand is um, then they pick on that person and then something happens to them. Now, maybe they kill the person, right? But something comes over them, you know, a spell, you know, spooky hoodoo voodoo stuff. They, that's what they think it is at first. And they realize the, 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 that something was different about this target we picked on, this target we gang stalked. Something was different. In other words, this time, all our lives got ruined. We all lost our jobs. They turned on us. They killed us. They, everything went wrong after that day. Yeah. You're messing with the kingdom of God, my friend. Do you understand? You're talking about the entire mode of creation on your head, seeking to crush you. You're talking about when you mess with, with you know, one of God's own, um, you have all the angels, all the creatures of the heavens, of the heavenlies, of the multidimensional um, the truth, all this power coming on, down on you. So what happens is when they, they know you're marked, they go, oh, gosh, he's marked. You know, cooties and you're... The first thing that happens is your own do you in. They turn on you for no reason. Because they saw you had the mark. You know, they saw in this, they don't know what they saw because they're too stupid. But they, 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 they sent something. And that's what being tagged is. So the Lord puts us out there. I know several people involved in this. The Lord puts us out there. I don't know, not, no, not all people are involved in the tagging issue. But the Lord puts people out there and like, you know, the gang stalker will stalk one, then another, then another. And seemingly, and they get the idea that, you know what? Some of them actually believe they have God's favor, even though they're structural Satanists and that's how they're seen in the overall truth of truth of truth of things, okay? So what ends up happening, and we're on a roll today, are we not, uh, boys and girls? So... Then they get to that like seventh one. And there's, don't, don't put any significance on seven, I just came up with that number. So they get to the seventh one, the seventh target. The se seventh TI, if you will, which is a dumb term, I don't like it, but I mean, you know, because uh, it's, 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 it's too, specific, it's really too um, earthly for me. But they get to the seventh one, suddenly, well, everything went wrong after that day. They got their way. They took out the target, let's say. They, they did everything the way they've always done, but something was different. Or the target, you know, the target um, somehow survived it, usually. Usually, like 90% of the time, the, 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 the person that's doing the tagging, they survive it. Something goes wrong. The thing gets, you know, the, the, the target didn't go where he was supposed to go. Something happened, whatever. Anyway, snafu. From that day forward, from that instant forward for the rest of that person's life this curse of the Lord is on them they can't there's nowhere they can go there's no job available to them there's no circle of friends available to them oh they can go do drugs and kill themselves sure they can go do that and whatever but you know and they can have some fast friends that way right because people are destroying themselves with drugs they get a lot of fast friends that's not friends but all that dries up the economic future is gone. Health future is gone. And the paranoia ensues that now they, who were the victimizer, have now become the victim. And so they know what they 
are capable of doing to other people. So now they're looking over their shoulder thinking it's going to be done to them, and that's their life for the rest of their sorry, miserable little existence. They're insignificant, nothing, garbage sack existence for the rest of their time upon the earth. Unless they repent and then they can, you know what I mean? And then they're welcomed as, as beloved brethren. But, but, but if shy of that, they're cursed. The person that was the target that where, where it happened, they didn't curse them. They didn't do anything consciously. We're not allowed to do that. We don't do that. It just happens. Do you understand that? We cannot be involved in cursing people. But the Lord can be involved in saying, you know, having, a, it's almost like there's a game with Satan. He's got all these pieces. And like, you know, you have your knights and you have your pawns and you have your queen and you have your king. You know, you have your, your rooks, right? And then this, but in this game of chess, this one rook, let's say, or this one knight, the horses, right? This knight here, of all the knight, but this one is the poison one. And then the, and, but no one knows which one it is until they try to take that knight out. And then you turn the piece over and you see, oh, and that, that kind of wipes out the whole army. They, see, if they got away with this one, this one, it's like Russian roulette. You never know when you're going to get that that one night that has, you know, that has the, that, that can, can mark you. You're marked forever, by the way. They, on their side, stupidly and superstitiously, which is what they are, superstitious stupids, they will say, ooh, that one's got bad juju. Some kind of bad witchcraft. I'm getting away from that. That's what they think. They think that, oh, someone threw a whammy on them. No, they're so arrogant. They don't understand. God also curses. And the reason he does it through lambs is because they don't defend themselves. Easy pickings. They wouldn't, you know what I mean? Some people get into spiritual warfare. I know when, when stuff comes in here, like, you know, there's never a time where there isn't some kind of something in the air that's negative. So it's like a daily thing, all day, all night. So I just, every once in a while, will pray that it be sent back to whoever, but it's kind of ridiculous because it's like a general thing in the air. So when you're talking about billions of people here, I'm not talking, there's no one, like one might throw a whammy over here, one witch or over there, over there, but it's, but, but it's kind of insignificant compared to the sea of negativity and bad vibes that you have to walk through. And um, which, which involves billions of people, not millions, not thousands, but billions of people. Not all the billions, but billions. So who are you going to, you're going to, you're going to you do spiritual warfare with billions of people? Because that's really who's involved. But yeah, the witches will focus that billions on, on, on the target. And when they do that in here, they get tagged. It's that simple. And um, I, you know, I see them. I, I've, you know, I've known some of them you know, personally and known exactly what spells and how they did what they did. And then followed them along. You know, and now on the internet, you can follow anyone and look them up again later. I see in one case there's no... no that uh, this one person's lo losing everything, lost her husband, and then her daughter will be lost very soon, and then her life and, you know, her economic ability, um, and is desperately out there trying to stare, a, find a man to, you know, and it's just too late. You know, was a hottie when she was younger, threw her weight around. She was laughing about how she could make people do this or make people, she did that to me. She said, watch, I'll make him do this. And then I would do it. And she'd go, you see, my power work, you know, real sorcerer, real bruja. And, and she was, in fact, had a whole coven full of these um, Mexican uh, brujas, the real, the real century and the real hardcore ones, right? She was at, the, like, the top of them. And she's a, she's a white girl, but, I mean, she was at the top of them. And they all would, like, worship. They would bow down and worship. It was on that level. It was really quite something. She was like the white witch. There's one out here in New Mexico. I'm not going to go into it personally. I'm not going to name names, but one that was 
semi-famous who, who we all call the White Witch. And, and uh, in the 80s, she, uh, I saw what she was up to. And uh, she tried to put one on me, and I, I saw I was in the spirit that day, and I just took, I took what she tried to throw at me, and I strangled her with it. <laughs> and then she was out of work for a couple of days. I mean, I didn't, you know, back then I was, I probably wouldn't do that today. Today I would just go, I just pray for the Lord's protection, and I would just pray that you know she wake up. So when you're talking about sending back, you have to be careful because you're talking about the air here. You know, you're talking about zzz, who the billions that are involved in that billions. Or the witch that focused it on you. Right? It's just like the power of the air. It, it, look, being on this earth and being one of God's is just, it's, 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 it's a total risk. Didn't the Apostle Paul say that every day is like lambs of the slaughter? Didn't, I mean, right? So, you know, I fully accept that. I understand there's a risk, so I'm, you know, a wiser man than... Well, I'm not really wise. I'm more like a child still, but uh, I can't help it. I just, I just love, I love silliness. But anyway, this guy, <laughs> he said, well, you know, uh, he's just not surprised at anything that happens. He goes, well, this was prophesied, and so, you know, it's going to happen. So I'm not surprised. And that's the wise man way to go. And I admire that because that's why I need to be, you know, rather than I am shocked that Obama has done all the things he's done. Now, okay, the topic of Obama. I have, you know, it, it could be that I just, maybe I was just totally off when I said prodigal. I mean, you know, I've, I've checked and rechecked with the Lord. Maybe I'm just, you know, I've certainly doubted myself on, on what that really meant because this guy is going, is, first of all, he is already marked, you understand. And so nothing works, right? Not like, oh, where's the adoration of the billions? Even the people coming across the border right now, they don't admire him, right? They don't respect him. Zero. Z zilch. No respect. So he's tagged. The man is tagged. So I don't know what it means. I, it just, just imagine if there is a legacy after this, what they would write about him. Given that the people who would be doing the writing will be suffering greatly pretty soon. And usually when you're suffering, you do not write a glowing report, right? Um, so it's up to him, that is Obama, to not get anything written or his people until, you know, a victory is achieved so that they can put writers on it that are part of the victory team so they will write a glowing review of the Messiah and how wonderful our new Messiah is, has been how the people were just racists, but now we've gotten rid of them all, and now all these other foreigners have moved into where they live, and life is happy ever after. <clears throat> you have to be an absolute fool to believe something like that. A moron of, of morons to believe that somehow, out of just all this mayhem and, 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 and suffering that you've caused, that somehow out of all this you'll be in bliss that somehow good fruit will come from a bad tree. You've got to be a moron to think that. You've got to be stupid. I just don't know. In the case of Obama, I don't really care anymore. You know, I've, I've kind of stopped caring. And I think the reason I've stopped caring is because I recognize there, isn't, there, there hasn't been a human in that vessel for some time. You know, there was a few years ago, but now what you're seeing is not human at all. That's, that's why there's such a coldness. You know, there used to be the hope and change. Remember that? And then there was this, there was a, there was a real guy there. He had a, a real heavy duty left wing ideology and I could, I could accept that, but there was an actual human in there. There is no more human there. We, we, we not only lost JFK, we lost this one. Where he went, I don't know. There's a vessel called Obama, but it's not him. And his wife isn't in, intact either. They're both um, under control of someone else or something else or a machine or something. So that's why it's, it's hard to be, to be em, empathic because I realize we're not really dealing with the human. You know, the Lord told me a long time ago, and maybe this perhaps passed his advice on. He said, look, you know, don't waste prayers and time on people that are dead. So I... You know, so I didn't spend more time in the churches. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
I'm being a little facetious there, but it, you know, it, it was like, don't waste my time is more specific to the message that I received. This is back before I went on the internet. Do not waste my time with people that are dead with the dead. Pray for protection from the living dead. They're living, they're in vessels, but they're dead. They're not, in other words, like I had a friend that I knew and I really loved this guy back when we were kids. He was just such a great guy, you know? We just had so much fun. I remember we were talking about with firecrackers one time and, you know, and, and you know, he, he, he put it in the water. He lit it and put it in the water thing, you know, and, and, you know, it was away from his hand, but it went off in the water and, and his hand was like in shock and, he, and they blamed me for it. <laughs> but uh, we shouldn't have been playing with those. But no, he got over it, didn't, didn't hurt him. But uh, he used to talk philosophy and, you know, he, he had all these great ideas and the world was all new and he was just so exuberant, you know. It was just, it was just a pleasure to be around him. Then finally I caught up with him many, many years later. He had been a lawyer and, you know, done that whole thing and had the house and the wife and the 2.5, you know, this, this whole life. Well, I had my alternative life, you know, and I'd gone away because I was taken away. And then I, you know, was brought back. You know, I've had a kind of, you know, a, a life way away from all that, you know. I was kept away from them because they, uh, what, society? I was kept away because they uh, didn't want to be around me and I... You know, really didn't want to be around them. You know, there was just this split. I went one way, they went another. Anyway, we caught up at long last. And then when he could see that we were who we were. But seriously, that boy that I knew, that exuberant, wonderful, creative, uh, super genius kind of fellow, wasn't there. He was just this rote kind of like a robot. And... I remember his wife broke down crying to Trish and, um, you know, about her husband. You know, because clearly it wasn't, nobody was home. And, you know, and she was intact and she was crying and, and I think asking Trish to help because I think they, she wanted help getting out of the lifestyle they were, you know what I mean? It was one of these big cosmic kind of moments. So all this trouble occurred. The next morning we stayed there their home and the next morning we were you know at about at a certain hour we were just shown the door <laughs> with no emotion like and don't come back type of thing it was so bizarre but uh, but expected I mean I, ex looking back on it it was exactly what had to happen you know then you know yes uh, yes that all the things that I said didn't happen they went through all the you know and I, I pray that these people uh can a person like that that wasn't there, was there, then wasn't there, get back? Yeah, they can. You know, but I mean, I guess what the Lord means by don't waste your time on the dead, it would be the dead where there is no, and this has to be a prophetic thing, this has to be a spiritual discernment issue, where there is no possibility of life. In this case, I believe there is, or was, but, but you know what I mean. This was like a time where there... It's just hard to explain because, you know, I got friends that are like in this situation and they're, and they have to be in the world and they have to make a living and they have to do all this stuff. And they, they're like, you know, and I'm saying, well, you can do all that with the Lord. Why not do it in conjunction with the Lord? Why not live your life for God rather than um, just for the approval of society or whatever? Because we need the approval of society in order to be gainfully employed. Well, then maybe you don't need to be gainfully employed in that manner. Anyway, two directions. I'm not here to argue that. You, you know, but Jesus had a message to Nicodemus. He had a message to a you know, wealthy man in society. Had a message to all of them. I'll say the same message. I'm not going to sit here. I have no judgment. I just miss my friend, right? I'd like to see him again. And hopefully I will. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. It was probably a mistake to have talked about don't waste your time on the dead and then brought this up. I, I don't want to infer that he's, he's dead. Other people I have come across have been. Um, I just don't know. The Lord has to kind of show you. But it's like once the Lord gives you the discernment that a person is twice dead, that is means there's no possibility. You know, they're, they're as good as already in the grave, but they're still walking around. 
those people, um, the Lord has told me not to waste my time on, but rather the the suffering people is what he want. You know, let's not get caught up in that, but let's, you know, he moves me on to something else. It's not like I go, oh, you're dead. You've got cooties. I'm not talking to you. It's more like you go, there's so many of them. You go through them, like through the zombies, and then there'll be one he wants me to focus on. That's how, kind of how it's been working. But um, no, I can't write off hope, you know. Uh, that, that was, a, you know, the church being dead, that's why I didn't do it. <laughs> the preponderance of robots in the church is, is really, it's amazing. And boy, they get so mad when we show up there. They get so, I remember when we went to John MacArthur's church and there was this guy in the choir behind the pulpit. And um, he just beat it in on me and Trish. He just, with just this hostile, like, it was like a demonic glare. Like, you get the F out of here, you know, type of thing. And, um, like, how dare you come in here? It was on that level. It was just really nasty spiritual warfare. And a friend of mine, he said, you know, if you don't get get with the devil, if you don't join, you know, the, the they don't say the devil, but they say if you don't, you know, conform or whatever, um, they're, they're going to get a restraining order on you so you can't even come near this place. So you mean to be a member of John MacArthur's church, you have to sell your soul to the devil, basically? And then if you're just like a maverick or a free spirit or just an individual walking around, you can't just come in here? No. I mean, you can, but you're going to have to lay low. Really? That's extraordinary. Um, I would have never thought that something like that could be possible. Or how did... How did his church get to be so reversed of, of normal? How, how did that happen? Because they sing, they pray, they feed the poor, they do, they sell all the, they have a big bookstore with CDs and MacArthur's books and they sign them and they have the, 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 the seminary there, they got the, they got the big church and they got a big campus where people go to school. What the heck are you talking about? This man has led a, uh, he's led a life of service. And um, he has a study Bible. You can see all his notes. He's very meticulously gone through the Bible so that you really understand God's word. How dare you say anything? I said, I'm not saying anything about that. I just went there and this is what happened to me. I was threatened there. Trish was. We were. Trish told me a story about someone that had the Holy Spirit and she just woke up to the Lord Jesus. You know how you, how you have this, you're on fire for the Lord. You've got this big Holy Spirit thing happening. Uh, baptism by fire. Everything's happened. You're prophesying. Blah, 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 blah. And, and, and she went in there prophesying. And they, they made her shut up. They, they don't want you. When I was there, I was prophesying too. I was prophesying in the sanctuary, I remember. And I was told to shut up. And I was doing it by email. Because I would get messages. I was just... It was just so, when I was younger, it was just seemed like it was just all day, just constant, you know. It was just so exuberant, it was so wonderful, and, uh, but it was chaotic too. But I was told by people in the church system to be quiet, and not just one, two, three, but everywhere I went. That I didn't have anything legitimate to say until I became a legitimate member, and I was approved of by the committee, or the board, or whatever it was, and then I would have the right to write and or speak and could be called, you know, uh, apostle this or prophet that or whatever. But only once I got my bona fides by the group, if you could imagine such a depraved and incredibly anti-Christ thing as that. Anti-spirit, anti-holiness, anti-God. If you can just imagine how someone could get to that point. Total spiritual death. And then they run the religion business. Anyway, so this, I didn't drop the thread, folks. So this girl comes in, she's filled with the Holy Spirit in this women's group that Trish is in. And Trish would go there, you know, every week and they get together. And she was told also to shut up. And then she went back another week and I think after a couple of times... The on fire thing, what happened is she was completely muted. The Holy Spirit was gone. 
Uh, she had no spiritual discernment whatsoever, no spiritual life, no excitement, no happiness about finding the Lord. All that was wiped out within about a week or two. And she was there like a Stepford wife, like a robot. And Trish reported to me about what she saw. What she, they, she, they killed the Holy Spirit in her. They killed her. Now she's a good John MacArthur uh, sycophant. And the same thing happened in a class on baptism. The, the teachers there were teaching this class about baptism. And I was there as a student because they said I had to be baptized. And I finally got baptized in, you know, the old-fashioned way. But, I mean, I was there, you know, and they couldn't teach the class because they, they really had no... I guess maybe I spooked them or we did, Trish and I. Would. So I had to kind of... So people were eagerly asking questions, which the teachers couldn't answer. I'm like, you people have been to seminary, you got master's degrees, you're in divinity school, you're graduating here, and you can't teach people about what baptism is when they ask a question about the spiritual aspects of it all. No, they could talk the book and the book of theology, and they could talk the rote answer. But it wasn't good enough for some of the people there. They were curious. They had questions. So I had to take over and answer their questions even though I was sitting there as a, as a student. And uh, be, no, no, it was easy to do. They were asking spiritual questions, and I was just in the spirit. Uh, but they made sure to tell me that if I want to continue with them, I have to get out of the spirit, or they would bar me from the church, because they don't want me to take over classes and start teaching people, which is, you know, which is why they would... That was the reason they would get rid of you. If you had any influence on people, then they wouldn't want you around. Right? They, they want, first of all, first thing you do at John MacArthur's church is kill yourself, destroy the spiritual life, become a sycophant, a, a slave, a robot, right? Turn your mind over to their books and whatnot. And, um, you know, and then, walk, and, then, and then walk in unison with the other dead zombies. And that's what I saw there. I have never changed my story or opinion. I would have no problem going there and visiting and watching them do their act. But I didn't see anything there. I saw the people that were intact that had the Holy Spirit were the people in wheelchairs and the ugly people, quote unquote. And the people that were not intact were the more well-to-do, civilized, employed uh, good upstanding citizen types, they were the dead. And then that's what I saw. That's what I literally saw. Now, they wanted me to unsee that, and they said, you know, we'll let you in if you just drop all this. First thing you got to do is drop the truth about all this. Just drop it. Second thing you got to do is, like, you got your sponsor over here, an older gentleman that got me into the thing. You got to just do what he tells you, you know, and don't voice any opinion and just cool it and, and everything will be all right. So I asked him about it, and I, and I said, you know, so this is not a house of worship, right? Where you, you can go in and, you know, uh, freely worship the Lord and freely talk to each other. I mean, everything is, everyone has a handler, it seems, and a controller. You're really talking to a committee, and if you say the wrong thing, then they get mad. And that's how it was run. Uh, they would be better off with Nazi uniforms on. I didn't see any love. I just saw a militaristic kind of pecking order. And that was one famous Christian. And his legacy, what he has left. And the world celebrates this man, of the Christian world, and his work against Islam, he was warning about Islam a long time ago, and he's been born out to be true now, and all that stuff. And he's been, you know, if you read his writings, you, I'd be, I posted some of his stuff on Facebook and, you know, things that he's written in a secular way. He's not a bad guy. You know, there's no blame in this. Let me, let me also say this. I mean, he's not a bad guy. They're not bad people. My sponsor wasn't a bad guy. Not at all. They were... 
quote, good people. He said, these are good conservative Christians. I'm talking about something entirely different than what your physical identity would be. These were good conservative Christians, gainfully employed. Typically, they would vote, you know, for the conservative candidate. And they would vote, they were capitalists. But not a one of them was free. <laughs> Uh, spiritual slavery was rampant there more than any other place I'd seen. I mean, that was quite extraordinary. And if you weren't willing to become a slave like them and give up the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't get in. But it was all done hush-hush. You would never see that, folks. The, the surface is what you would see. Like someone said, you know, you've talked about this Calvary Chapel thing, and, and I've never seen that there. It's like, you yeah, know, I'm... I've, I, uh, I'm the, you know, I walk the walk, I see things and I say it, you know what I mean? I see things and I say it. And uh, just because you haven't seen it literally doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm talking about a lot of spiritual things, things that are invisible, things that um, you'd have to just ask the Lord if I'm full of it or not. But in the past, I have not been unaccurate when, you know, there hasn't been um, I mean, people have tried to say, you're crazy, you just made all this stuff up, it's just blah, 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 and I'm like, no, I, I didn't make anything up. You know, but then you'll have to be the judge of that. I don't have any, you know, the reason I mention it is because I need to mention this, because this has been, when I see something, I must say it. And I know it's not convenient to, because you could take the MacArthur Church and just and just multiply that by the Rick Warrens and the, all the other ones, you know. And I don't know why. I don't. I look, it's a mystery to me that why, when you say House of God, you should be able to go in there, and and have an experience with the Lord. I mean, it should be even more spiritual than out on the street. You know, that's what I thought. So I was just shocked to find, you know, that I. I couldn't find, the same thing happened to me in, in Buddhism when I went to, uh, so we could say religion in general, because I don't want to pick on, you know, MacArthur. I, I, I like the man, you know. I, I like his values. I like what he writes about. You know, I've, I've got nothing against him, okay, um, personally. Or, you know, I don't consider him to be some kind of evil guy. It's just this is the thing that ends up happening. And nobody wants to say anything because, yeah, he is a good guy. And, you know, there are good people there. And nobody wants to, to, to say, well, there's a cancer, right? They, they want to think that, you know, the Lord wouldn't allow that, something like that to happen, spiritual death, because of the fact that uh, there's this, this other thing going on, not wink. Um, that we're just sinners, we're all saved in Jesus. I wish I could have a better report. But the same thing happened to me, and I've always been like that. You know, I've always been, <laughs> you know, says whatever no one wants to say at the dinner table. So I guess I'm elected. Same thing happened in Buddhism when I went there, and, the, and the, my sponsor, who was a, at that time a, a working actress, and, and, uh, and, you know, interesting, I actually had a, a stint of living up on Lookout Mountain in her house one of her guest rooms. Was, she had a big kind of a mansion thing and, and that seemed to be the center of all the Laurel Canyon intrigue. Lookout Mountains off Laurel Canyon, in the canyon. Anyway, so she sponsored me, you know, and then I started asking questions and I started, you know, unraveling the threads. It's another slave thing. And then she said she was really sorry that she ever introduced me to it. Because the whole thing busted up. So I even went to the organization head of this Buddhism. And I started asking questions down there. And I found out, well, you've got to have priests somewhere. I found out they were out in Pasadena somewhere. Where I drove out to where the priests were. And they were Japanese and you, you had to get a translator. But I, I had to ask them some questions. I had to find out what was wrong. Because all these people were just mindlessly chanting and to this like piece of paper and they were chanting for you know, money and sex and drugs or whatever, I don't know, you know, parking places, cars, you know, jewelry, I don't know, you know, they were, right? And I was, but I understand Buddhism to be spiritual. So I was like, where, I need that. I came here because I need that. I need some kind of spiritual nourishment. 
Where is it, priest? What is this? And they would force people to get haircuts and wear blue blazers and gray slacks and black shoes and put patriotic pins on them and wave the American flag when they have their conventions, right? They had one at, somewhere in L.A. was maybe the L.A. Forum or some kind of... But they would, it was filled with people all waving American flags and trying to look like the most ultimate you know, patriotic Americans and all, and they were like, wow, these are all Buddhists. And there was, there's emphasis on this. And I said, what, what are you doing that for? Anyway, that coupled with, you know, having some kind of illegal affair with a, with, with a leader's wife. Yes, that was wrong. You know, I repent. That was terrible. Um, you know, that helped to, you know, dislodge confidence, but it was, you know, it was just, I was just, look, I just went in as like a free spirit. I would go there and I remember, you know, um, I was taking people there that the way it is is they have cells, right? They have little uh, areas where like people's houses where they get together every, you know, I don't know, once a week and uh, have this, uh, this ritual they do, you know, you do, which is part of it is just uh, chanting and reciting the, um, uh, two chapters of the Lotus Sutra in an ancient Japanese dialect, which and most people have, actually haven't memorized. They're so they have come na, 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 like a freight train, right? Uh, a friend of mine that taught religion, he uh, he called it born again Buddhism. Anyway, so it was it was quite a ride. But I mean, it, all this inquiry and this. Then I was going over to the city center and taking people from this thing over there where you had to enslave yourself to uh, this uh, Guru Mai woman, you know, uh, and the, she was in town, so everyone lined up to, to wash her feet and to bow down. I'm, I'm like, what the, f you know, really, <laughs> seriously? And I was like, they're, they're nothing but robots. I said, where is the spiritual? And I, I'm a big fan of Hinduism. I'm studying Hinduism. And I, I want to talk about Maya and Samsara, and, you know, I want to talk about these concepts of, you know, uh, moksha and all these other kind of things. I want to talk about some of this stuff, you know. Darshan, and, you know. But they, they said, well, we'll talk to you about Siva, which is service to the guru, right? And, and, and the guru is God on earth. The guru is God on earth, really. An avatar, no less. Um, so quite an opposite of Buddhism. So we went over there and, 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 and they were chanting the Hindu chants and had a harmonium going and the drum and it all sounded very much like something in India, right? And uh, everyone was very, very serious, but there was no spirituality. And then I went to the cell. There was one near my house. It happened to be just like the Buddhism thing. There was one near the house and they'd all get together and it was like the man, the woman in the house was kind of running things and they would have this like little, you know, sort of ritual thing and this, this sort of chant thing and then, and meditation. And uh, that was, and I said, there's no nourishment. I need help. I need, I need to start reading Muktananda's book, The Siddha Yoga Founder. And I was, you know, diving into everything I could dive into. I just needed so much something. And I wasn't getting it. Not in MacArthur's church or the Catholic church or the, or the Buddhism and the Hinduism, dang it, all of it. The same dry, dead bones every single place. And then they all blame me. They're like, well, you're the one that's the problem. I said, but it is what it is. The people are becoming robots and ritualized because they like their familiar rituals. They like a certain ritual every time. And then I went to the Vedanta Center up in the Hollywood Hills. Um, I, 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 I avoided Scientology. I went to the Krishna Center down on Venice Boulevard, you know, and the, the, the free vegetarian feast and did that whole Krishna thing. I went to Zen Buddhism, both Rinzai and Soto uh, uh, centers. I found the same thing there. White people enslaved. <laughs> the same, they're right, the same thing. Troubled, um, you know, kids from upper middle class families, some trust fund babies as well, troubled, and then shaving their heads and becoming monks and being enslaved to just do 
manual labor and keep their mouths shut. But they said that they felt better, or in this one case, this one woman said, you know, she was uh, going to shrink, she was going to here, she was going there, but now she finally found peace in with her master in the Zen center there. Um, but anyway, I didn't find any help. You know, I didn't find any peace. It wasn't that it was so hard to do. I just, I didn't find any help down there. You know what I'm saying? I didn't find any peace. I, uh, I just was so needing help. You people that remember me from then, you said I was a troubled soul. Some friends I had, they, well, they got so mad when I said something about the churches or about society. They thought that, I'm like, I'm not judging you. I don't want you to have a bad result. That's why I might bring it up. But my God, if, you know, if we all decide that we're not going to talk about a certain thing, and everyone's going to cover it up. You know what's going to happen? What you have today is what happens. This situation we have today is a direct result of the thing that we talk about on the Zephyr Report. Exact one-to-one -one correlation, no other way to look at it. So I bring it up so that you might be saved, so that you might live, so that you might be at peace, so that you might have an answer, a reason to live, so that you might have honesty and freedom in your life, so that you might be able to finally stop running and gunning. So that we all might be able to cooperate better and avoid a mass slaughter. That's why the Zeph Report exists. Not for me, it's got nothing to do with, I could have been gone last year. I, I get nothing at, there's, it's, it's, I'm not on any soapbox here. I got, no, I got nothing to gain here. Except maybe a better world for my daughter to live in. But I know that the things I've said over the years, you know, does, have made a difference. Especially, you know, when people weren't uh, awake and they thought they were. Because conspiracy theories is not going to wake you up. Sorry. A conspiracy theorist could not see what I've seen and explain it the way I've explained it. Could not. Could not understand what's really wrong. You can say all these conspiracies, but they're meaningless without an understanding of why. How? Where from? What's this? What is this multidimensional reality where we only see one dimension? What is this? What is this life? By the time I figure out what life is, it's, it's over. What the heck is that a horrible punishment for? You know, I'm here. I have to fend off the bullets flying my way. I try to get through in one piece. At the end, I'm so uh, messed up. I don't care anymore. Just take me away. What kind of life is that? Thanks a lot, God. So when people get to that conclusion, usually in high school, uh, the next thing they do is they use that as an excuse for just tearing it up. And they learn, and they become socialized, and they learn to keep their mouths shut, just like the church tries to teach, just like the, 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 the Buddhist temples teach. They teach the same thing. Um, all of them teach the same thing. They all teach death of the spirit. Because, you see, if you're a free spirit, you don't need them. They're out of a job. You don't need a priest Yes, but I want one. Well, okay, the price for you having one is you have to become a slave. And then you become dependent on what they teach you because they're not going to talk to you unless you follow the teachings of the Catholic Church, let's say, or of uh, Nichiren Buddhism. You know, if you want to talk to those priests, you have to have a gohong zong and you have to be in good standing. And then you shouldn't have to talk to the priest because what for? You have everything you need right now. You've got your piece of paper that has the absolute reality on it. You recite some chapters out of the Lotus Sutra in an ancient Japanese dialect. You, you, you chant Namyoho Renge Kyo for any time you want something, and uh, materially, of course. And um, and it wasn't enough for me, folks, so I, I kept seeking. And the friend that introduced me to it, Susan, she was so mad. 
And then the whole thing busted, that whole household busted up. And then they blamed it on me. But I didn't do anything. I was just, it was just the spirit, I guess, of just being there, just broke it up. Because you, to make a con game work, everyone's got to be on the page. You can't have somebody that's like thinking the tr in the truth because then it upsets everybody. They don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. If they get upset anyway. I've been in rooms where people just start going off the deep end and a guy comes up to me and goes, you did this. I said, I did, what, what, what happened? She went crazy. Well, I didn't do anything. Because, because the presence of one of you causes them to go off script. When they go off script, they become out of control. They, 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 you have to understand, if you were to take away uh, their years and years and years of mind control and just for a glimpse of a moment, take it away by your presence even, they flip out and then the handlers have to come in and get them back. And then they say, you stay the heck out of here. But I didn't even say anything. Okay, that, and that alone, and only that is the reason for the destruction of the civilization, or the reason we're at the precipice at this point. It's the reason the world is the way it is today. There is no other reason. There is no, not, not any other reason. Just that, and that alone. If that wasn't there, there would be no problem right now. The world would have a chance. People would have a chance. But the world's not going to give that up because they feel that they will be extinguished if they do. So they're going to stay the course and kill us all. But if I die in this thing, like if there's a big war or whatever, or they overrun the borders and they you know, come to kill us all, whatever they do, or a plague, which is more likely. But whatever happens, if I die in this, I want you to know that this and this alone was my entire message. Because this and this alone is the reason for everything. Period. There is no other reason for the horrors of the world. Not even one. Not even one. And conversely, for life itself, the goodness of the Lord, there's only one reason as well. And we live in this kind of dual nature dichotomy. And what has happened is that, the, um, that this thing that doesn't exist has festered and grown to the point where now it will, like a, like a big parasite, and it will now poison and engulf and take the patient out. Uh, the responsibility for it happening is all the mothers and fathers, all the priests, all the teachers, all the people screaming about politics and being on the left or being on the right or being here and being there. All of these people whistling by the graveyard are responsible and will be held accountable for causing the destruction of billions, if it should go to that. Certainly they are today responsible. I mean, we all are to a certain extent. I want to, I want to preface it by saying that because I don't want to be an us and them thing. You know, if, if I could confess all my evils and I could make amends and, and it would change things, I would. If, if you just tell me what to change, I'll do it. But it's the secrecy about this thing that the Lord has said will be revealed. But I guess when it's revealed, that means it's the end. <laughs> so they all kept it, you know, right? Um, but that's wrong, too, because it's just like when that woman flipped out when she was in the presence of, of one of us. Um, you know, if, if the truth comes out, then as it is now in mass, it's coming out everywhere. Uh, not, not, you know, the, 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 the fulcrum of it all. But, but at, at the, the very least, it's just flooding out. And so they're acting anyway in the, in the light, which we've never seen before. And they're, they're just going ahead and doing what they do in the light. Anyway, you know, and no one's doing anything about it because people are still going, you know, maybe it'll just go away. And um, I'm here to tell you, it's really, when I watch these people, I mean... I have to say, I, I think that the destruction of, this, of the 
civilization, which is what I, you know, uh, I told you so.com. But God's people are not really, you know, people are getting killed right and left, but that's, that's, it's strengthening the church. That's the weirdest thing. The church means the ecclesia. It's strengthening the ecclesia. God's people around the world. Because we won't tolerate it. And, and even now you're calling, people are calling for you know, bombing these people because they're killing Christians. You know, Obama doesn't want to because he will, you know, the reason Obama uh, says bombing won't help is because he wants the slaughter of Christians. That's his whole goal. I mean, that's, that's, that's what guys like him do. They kill Christians. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a Muslim, basically, and um, they, um, they try to act like he isn't, but that's what he is, structurally. Technically, that's what he is. And so he's for that uh, jihad and, and taking on that. And, you know, he feels that if there were no Christians on the earth, that's why the Christians are considered terrorists in America, because of, of him. And um, it's very simple. But people make it so complicated. But, I mean, he is, you know, basically sets the tone. And, you know, in the government, there's all kinds of people in, in the Pentagon and institutions. They, they agree with him, and they want to bring their god, Lucifer, to the fore, and they feel he's the way to do it. So they're going to keep supporting him. So even though he's had... And I predict he will have further. Uh, they'll, they'll eventually have to, you know. This guy was the guy they pinned all their hopes on. They hoped he would be the Antichrist, and they hoped that this whole thing would happen because of him. But now it's just all been exposed, and it's all ugly and tawdry, perverted, you know, dirty. And that's how people feel: shamed and dirty in America. You know, not, not for themselves, but just, it, it's a dirty, ugly thing. It's just, just, life right now is dirty and ugly. You know, nothing is sacred. And whenever Obama speaks, people just start laughing. You know, he tries to act important. It's like, <clears throat> let me get in my act here. And people don't believe him. Just like they said, no one believes you to the IRS guy. They have the same exact feeling about... Whenever Obama speaks, people just turn away because they just don't believe anything he says because everything he says is generally a lie. Everything Hillary Clinton says is generally a lie. I mean, it, everything George Bush says is a lie. Everything they all say is a lie. So people have less trust in any... You know, it's, we're at that incredible point. But the, how we got here to this ugly, terrible chapter in America is because of this issue that we, that we talked about. This thing that causes, if one go, person goes in the room, they're told to leave the room because it causes the woman to flip out that. See, if you have everyone under control and you have that, that, that control factor on that woman, she can't be real. As long as she's not real, as long as something real doesn't disturb her, she's under control, we have a society, you see. But the minute the truth comes in, oh my God, the whole thing is wrecked. It's Armageddon on steroids. It's all over. As soon as the people recognize the emperor is naked, it's all over. The whole thing would collapse, so we can't ever say that. And you teach your kids to keep their mouths shut, and they'll get the pudding. As long as they do it the way that we're, we, we, will, we will train you to do it, and you do it that way, you bring your kids up to do it that way, and we'll all get along just fine. How about that? Come on in for the big win. Don't you love your country? Remember that Full Metal Jacket talking to the, to uh, Private Joker? Or is it uh, yeah, Private Joker? He was called the Joker. With Kubrick, there's no accidents. Everything is is exactly exacting with Stanley Kubrick. Everything has a reason. Down to the names, Private Joker. Why? Because of the dual nature of the Joker. Because on his helmet it had a peace sign and kill them all, both. So he got a good talking to. So the general came around, or the, the CO, right, came over and, you know, and he was a journalist. He, it's like he had to give him a little pep talk about getting on the team, right? Getting the right mindset. But the Joker, you know, was, was like us. We, 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 we couldn't, he, he couldn't conform to that, to just getting on the team and going to dinner. I had this problem when I was a kid, when I was trying to play in uh, team sports, and then they'd have like little um, 
I remember I would go to a, a, a function, you know, a social function, because we had won the league or whatever, and, and everyone was acting a certain way. And I remember I, I, was, I put on my best act at being, you know, I'm one of the team, and we're big football players. And I, or how, how does a football player act? Okay, I'll just, mm, there you are, I'll have a cigar, ha <laughs> ha. You know, and I was trying my best to come up with an act that would make me get along with the other boys, you know. I, I, I really, um, uh, I, 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 you know, and, and the coach and the uh, teachers and the, and the school and, and the, um, the whole thing, I had to put on an act every day like, okay, here's how you act when you're a kid at this school, like this, <laughs> see, you know, and it was all, it was all phony. Masking, of course, the fact that I was totally disturbed and totally upset. And people got really mad. They said, aren't you ever happy? Can't you just be happy? I mean, can't you just appreciate, you know, what you know? I'm just, so, I am disturbed with the whole notion of this life. What, what's this for? I must find out more about it. Well, you can't do that around here. Keep talking like that, you get yourself kicked out. Well, what, what do you think? You think we're cows chewing our cut or, you know, steers chewing on the grass and, and you think there will be a slaughter truck coming or is that just a stupid rumor? We're just out here having a great life. So that's the kind of thing and, you know, that's, that's, that's where it all started with me. You know, that's, that's you know, the, the, see, my inquiry, because I didn't, I wasn't a big Jesus freak or anything, but my inquiry... You know, I remember I had, I told you about this collage I had where I had Martin Luther King and, you know, Bobby Kennedy and, and John F. Kennedy, the three of them surrounded by, I, I would cut out like news headlines, you know, why, who killed, stuff like that. And it drove my parents insane, it drove my mother insane. She ripped it all down off my wall. I thought, wow, you know, wow, that's, that's an interesting reaction. Um, you just can't think that way. Stop it. This is society, you mean, know? mm -hmm. So you see, because I was at that time beyond political parties, you see what I mean? I didn't consider, uh, I, you know, because I had Bobby Kennedy and Jack Kennedy and Martin Luther King. So I wasn't really, and I think that even disturbed them because they were conservatives. But the point is I was, they, they were there on my wall because I wanted to find out what exactly went on here. What's going on here? They said God is dead. I had God is dead from the uh, Time magazine. I, I took the cover of Time. I put up there, God is dead. And I uh, wish I had that, that piece of artwork now. Oh, boy. But anyway, um, yeah, that's all I want to do is talk about all that kind of stuff. And um, that kind of thing is anathema to school. It's anathema to church. It's anathema to all religions. It's anathema to the U.S. military. It's anathema to... Um, being uh, an intern in Hollywood. It's anathema, you right? It's anathema, you, you, exactly. To be something in Hollywood, you have to shape yourself into, in other words, th this idea that you would put on an act to be like what a football player boy of 15 or so would be, how he's supposed to act, and then, you know, you know do likewise. This is how we do it. This, we're men, this is how we act. <laughs> And then if you start saying, if you start having that thought, like I'm having now, what I'm describing to you, which I was describing back then, they all get up uncomfortable because they can't trust you because you, you're just not going to go ahead and just come on in, join the team and just shut up. It wasn't going to happen. I tried my best. I, I... I'm not going to swear on my parents' graves because that's a sin, but I, I did my best at uh, uh, attempting to, to conform and to, to, to be just like them. I wanted to be just like a real boy, like a human being, just like them. You know, I worked so hard to keep a, a facade, even if I didn't know who I was or just or was just lost beneath the mask. I... I put it on. I wanted to be like who? Someone in society, and we're going to go off to college, and we're going to come on in for the big win, and we're going to have. It's all going to be peaches and cream. I'm going to just get this act, and 
and I couldn't keep it up, I couldn't keep it up, I couldn't keep it up, and, and people knew I was, because they were for real, they, they seemed to me to really be that person. I'm like, are you really? And I knock, knock, is anybody home? Hey, do you see? No. No, I really am this person. Are you putting me down? Really? You're on the team and everything? It's all, this is like everything? This is toto e toto. This is all of all? This is it? Yeah. Really, that's the real you in there? That yeah, really you? Turns out, at long last, that wasn't really them. They were just a lot better. I, I couldn't put on the act. I couldn't play pretend. I, could, I couldn't do it. I, I wanted so badly to please my parents. I wanted to please people. But something just made it so I was a, it just, you know, like, it, like you could be in this thing and you could be like uh, the rock people and play, and here's how rock stars act. Oh, we'll, uh, have, we'll put a mask on. And this is what sex is. It's like, well, I only want to, you know, have sex when I feel like it. No, 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 no. We all have this sex thing. Oh, really? What's that? No, just shut up and do it. <laughs> Don't ask what anything means. I want to know what sex is. What's it for? <laughs> Why do we do it? Aren't we slaves to it? Doesn't it just control us? Uh, we want more of it, so we want to be more successful and more conformatory, conformianity, conforming, so that we can then have more sex. Don't you want sex? You can have sex with anyone you want. I mean, you know, the world will see you as uh, what we want them to see you, but, you know, you're free to let your hair down and let it go, whatever it is. Why? Don't say that. Just, you want to be with us or you want to be with them or you want to be with them. Wherever you go, it's the same thing. I just want to know why the world's so messed up. I want to be, you know, uh, like I said, you, you, you can't tell me when and where I'm going to have sex or when and where I'm going to work or when and where I'm going to do this or that. You, I'm not your slave. If I feel like it, I'll do it. If I don't, I won't. How's that? You're kicked out. You do what we tell you to do and then you can have an illusion of freedom which then you'll be accepting of and you'll be happy with because you'll have all the perks and everything will be fine. Just come on in for the big win. Don't you love your country? So that's where I'm at, ladies and gentlemen, um, where I have... Uh, that's the... Some people say I'm in a rut. Well, that's the rut that I've been in since childhood. In a nutshell, once again, spinning it around another way so we can look at it. Um, some people, yours truly included, believe that life is just much more, it, it begs to be looked into. And to join any one of these things and be happy, um, to consign oneself to that is to consign oneself to mental slavery and to turn the questions off, to turn the inquiries off. Oh, I had one guy. Oh, gosh, this was great. It was a, a friend of uh, my mother-in-law. And, and we were in, I remember we were in Rancho Mirage. I think it was at the Ritz-Carlton. or They used to have a hotel there. They may have one again. I don't know. But it was, uh, I don't know why we were there. There was some kind of conference or something. Anyway, we were going to get together for dinner. And, and this guy, he was just so... Nasty, such a nasty, awful human being, you know, just a, just a real kind of mean, judgmental, I don't know, just really, you know, and he was on my case, you know, right off the bat. I hadn't even seen him, you know, I just, I just was up there shaking his hand, being polite, you know, I, I'd never met him before. And right off the bat, he goes, you know, I got over all that in college. I'm like, what? I'm, I'm, I'm just here enjoying the desert, you know, enjoying the, hey, you know, I'm buying you dinner. Why don't you just, you, you know, attack me? Well, go ahead. Meaning all the inquiry, and I, and I remember I brought my Bible down there. 
and I this was just before going on to the uh, to the internet. You know what I mean? I, I I was definitely into the Lord, and I was definitely just so excited about the Word of God, and you know what I mean. And, and his answer to that was, I got over that in college, just out of his out of the blue, saying like something like that. And I'm like. So that's obviously demonic, right? I mean, that's not a normal conversation between people. It's like, hi, how are you? Uh, you know, Zaf, good to meet you. And hey, good to meet you too. What's happening? Hey, yeah, this is pretty good on the menu. You know what I mean? It was an expensive hotel, expensive. Uh, you know, it should have been just polite. Come, But that, that was, in a nutshell, that was the whole church experience right there. The same exact thing. In other words, shut the F up. We got over that in college. That's when we turned our minds off. And we got busy, you know, making a living for our children. Now just shut up. And I've always been creative. I, I put most of this in poetry, lyrics. But then it had to spill over into the podcast because I realized yesterday, especially after I talked to this... Uh, uh, sister in Christ person I had trouble with learning about the organized stalking and that all and, and which, which is in other words another way of saying persecution and some you know if you're a certain kind of person like if you can't play pretend if you see through the game then you get targeted it doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist, an atheist, or this or that. It doesn't matter what you believe about God or not. You're targeted. Period. This entire show I dedicate to the people who are stalked. And I want to tell you a message. That's so why I told this uh, young lady yesterday. Uh, here's the message. What you saw feeling like you're being targeted individuals. I wish you would all, let's all drop that term, can we? Please. It's just so secular. It's just, it's just it's, it's so one-dimensional. It really does not say anything. Um, look, this is about to go mainstream. It is gone mainstream. The right now, all the American people are targeted. If you like, in the same way you were years ago, they are now. See, it, the rollout has happened, but they they focused on you as targets, but they were eventually going to go to all people as targets, and now that has happened, okay? So you're no longer special, and I need to tell you that because you feel like you've lost the significance as a TI, right? It's not that big a deal anymore, right? A lot of people feel that way. And um, I'm here to tell you, well, the whole point of the, of the selective organized stocking was that eventually it was going to be rolled out to the to be mainstream to be whole peoples. Now you understand that it's look, the greatest organized stock in the world was say like in Stalin's Russia and Nazi Germany, right, and in and in Maoist China. That's where it comes from, and they it's the Kafkaization, if you will, of the world, and eventually it goes mainstream so that all people are suspic suspected, all people are targeted, because none of them can be trusted. And they're all guilty of crimes, but we will never tell you what your crime is. Kafka, right? So, you know, and to my um, pretend friends out there, pretender friends, who pretended to be in society, now it's all unraveling. Um, look, man, there is no future in being uh, fake. There's no point in shutting up and nodding and winking. All nodding and winking leads to is total destruction for everybody, including your children. You know, uh, secret societies are no damn good. You know that. Fraternities and sororities are no damn good. You know that. All this stuff, you know, when there's secrecy and when there's an us against them and when there's an inside track, you know, it's, it's nice, I guess, Temporarily, but there's a, a piper to pay at the end. You can live for God and do your business and do your do you do what you do. You know, it, you can live for truth and do what you do. Well, got to me another word for God is truth. So you can live for truth and 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 you know be involved in your business, be involved in 
you know, your innovation. Be involved in your software company that's made you a billionaire. I love it. I want that success for you. Because then you spread it around because you're going to be investing in things and then the whole society benefits. I'm a great believer in that. I'm just talking about the thing, the cancerous thing that kills us as a society. And I think we should, uh, you know, and now the last part of this podcast is going to be, you know, I have to talk as fast as I can to get all this in because it's very structured, as you can see. Like, you could break it down with a syllabus and chapters. And I've tried to say it all, but here's the final word on this today. We ought to put all that aside and quit trying to tip it in our favor one way or the other. We ought to all just... You know, um, all this, you know, structural Satanism, elitism, um, you know, secret societies and all this, uh, the clubs and the inside track. And I, I mean, I was in all that. And all I can say is, you know, it leads to this feeling of being privileged and then other people being left out and then eventually they go crazy and they kill you all and then they're privileged and then they, they, the other people are left out and then they kill them. Can I say that in that way without offending anyone? Now, I used to really think about a lot of this when I was like 17. Yeah, I got over that in college. Hey, dude, before you, when you were in diapers, I was, I, when I was in diapers with you, I was thinking about all this stuff. Okay? Didn't get over it then. I knew about it when I was five. Didn't go over it at five. At seven. Didn't go, what, why at five? Because I was, um, I had been put in a ritual uh, sexual abuse situation. And so my eyes were open. Oh, that's how the world works. I see. Even people who write about conspiracies, like, um, you know, like the Laurel Canyon thing and other things, when they come across something real, like me, for example, scares the hell out of them. Well, I have a lot of respect for the book that Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, David McGowan. Dave, yeah, he's, he's wrote a great book. I couldn't put it down. So I, I love the book. I'd love to talk to him sometime. But I do believe that my kind of the thing on the Internet and the, and the podcast, I do think that, you know, it's, it's like, it's hard to explain, but, you know, it would, it, it's bad juju. I'm, I'm bad. You know, I'm bad because I'm, you know, if you're trying to get somewhere like with publishing and all that, you know, don't don't be around me because it's just gonna it's it, it's the opposite. Yeah, you have to play the game and schmooze to be a be published. You've got to put that mask on. And I suppose one could say that about anything and go, well, we're just trying to survive. And it's like, well, but we're not surviving. That's the point. Well, then there is no other, then we're just screwed from the beginning and nothing matters anyway. So, I'll, you know, I think I'll start playing the game myself. In fact, I'm to the point now where I should shut up. So I will. Uh, you can just discount everything I said. I'm putting my mask on now and I'm, I'm just sick of, struggling for the truth and trying to walk the truth and all this. I think I'm just going to go ahead and... Is there any, any society I can... I want to join some kind of society. How about uh, Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society? How about, how about the Philosophical Research Society? Or how about, uh, how about um, uh, the Bohemian Club in San Francisco? Now, that's what I want to be in. I'm going to get into that. Uh, even at my age, you can cross-dress and you can put a makeup on and you can, you know, be, be one of the guys, you know, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, no problem. Okay, with that, I bid you shalom, shalom. And I, I'm, I'm yes, I'm being sarcastic and I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to have to go try to catch some disease. I don't know why, but when I'm up at that hour, you know, what happens is, you know, there's something that has to be said. And I believe that a good deal of this podcast had to be said and my, my joking around is uh, um, comic relief. Uh, I suppose a criticism of me, I can hear it coming already. So what you're thinking is, why can't you just find something 
and um, really get into that. And I'm, I'm like, well, I, I do that with, I love music. And, you know, well, if you just keep your mouth shut and don't do these podcasts anymore, maybe, you know, you could help some people out with me. You could get into the music thing. Well, I don't want to get into the music thing. I, I want to have the best studio in the world, you know, technically. You know, for what I can do, for, for at least as a, as, a, as a mixing and mastering suite, I want to have, it, have the best, you know, everything that the, uh, the best studios have I want. And so that I can then fail. Because, see, that really gets me off. And, oh, no, the tracks will succeed, of course. Um... When we were at Sweetwater going to their the, the producer's death panel, I called it, uh, they, um, they basically said, look, shut the F up, play the game, try to become an intern, you know, uh, and, you know, do what you got to do. And that's how you come up and that's how you really get going with these big bands. You want to mix these big bands, do this big stuff, that's how it's done. And they said, well, but all the intern shop, jobs, have, if, which is, you know, the free, free blow job, right? All the, well, that's, I mean, that's what I learned when I was a kid, you know. But, but all those have dried up. Um, so you people out there, just go buy a lot of gear and uh, good luck. But don't ask me to hear your tracks. Okay, I don't want to hear your crap. And that's the attitude of the industry toward the, the people at Sweetwater who paid for them to be there. I was, I kid you not, that was the vibe. It was like, Wow. So just gather all these people who are all producers, who all buy very expensive equipment to, to, because they love music. They want it to sound the best they can sound. I'd say those are the people keeping the, uh, you know, the Poltex and the Manleys and all that. These are the people keeping them in business, not the studios. They buy it once, that's it. The, all these people that are buying that kind of gear that only the studios used to buy, they're out there. And they say, you buy that equipment. And so Manly shows up and, you know, the Poltec people making the old Poltex again. Probably the Fairchilds will be out there. They'll probably be revived pretty soon, too. You know, that was another limiter compressor tube thing, you know. And, but anyway, all these vendors are out there that, and they need to sell to, the, to all these, you know, quote, amateurs who are, by the way, mixing great stuff and, but, but, but are not in the Babylon. So... And they're very serious. They won't learn everything about it. And they, but, but, you know, because you're not coming up there. You know, you get us, go get us coffee, give us uh, whatever we ask you to do, you know. And then we'll let you mix, maybe, or maybe not. Then we heard that some of the interns they had went on and became other things that, that almost no intern got a job mixing. And then they were told that that's the only way you can do it. Well, they, all these people in the audience... We're probably mixing better than these guys, but they had the guy who mixed Thriller and the guy that, you know, mixed uh, won a Grammy last year for Daft Punk, and they, you know they had this whole panel of people, all basically saying the same thing: "You people out there are screwed. You're not getting in." I mean, we have what we have here is the this is a club, and we have the last bit of crumbs left, and you're not getting it. But we need you to go out and buy all that gear at Sweetwater because we want you. And if you know what, the Sweetwater people, if, if anyone happens to have gotten this far in the podcast, you know what, you need to hear this. So listen up, because I'm not going you know, to lie to you. You need to go out and buy gear, they're saying, because otherwise we couldn't have this little, you know, we, couldn't, we, couldn't, we wouldn't be here because all these companies that you're buying from sponsor us. We get money and stuff from them. So we need you to go buy the gear, but don't expect that you're ever going to get in the business. And I'm, I'm like... What I felt, see, can you imagine if you're, I kept my mouth shut and I was generally kind of accepted, but in, you know, can you imagine someone like me getting hold of the microphone and starting in on these people? The kind of, you, I'll tell you what happened. The whole place would have gone insane. The, the boom had been chaos and they would have walked out. But what I would have done is, you know, maybe the thing to have done is say, uh, no, I don't want to get that gross, but you know what I'm saying, right? I'm not going to get that gross here today. And then, and so the, the double message the people got was, you people are screwed, go out and buy gear because we need you to buy gear because since we're famous, we want you to you know, kiss our asses. 
And um, they were pathetic, these people, these producers. Absolutely pathetic. They're up there saying, oh, well, it's a hit record if everyone agrees it's a hit. Oh, really? Well, what if I don't agree? I don't, what if I don't want to hear Rush's um, Tom Sawyer again? Does that make me like a social pariah? You jerk. Do not talk down to me. A lot of these people out there, very serious. Like, I'm very serious. I, I probably put more time in the studio, more time in mixing than all of them combined. Because why? Because I'm, I love sound. Because I love it. That's, I'm just doing it because I love it. That's it. That's my motive. I'm not trying to please anybody. But the point is, is I was there in earnest. Me, I was there to get, you know, to upgrade my studio, to buy gear. I don't need to be um, condescended to. to, to isn't it? It, now, most of the people there didn't realize they were being condescended to. You see, it's another thing like, I was there at Sweetwater during that gear fest, and so everything you're saying, you, you're just making this up. Everyone had a great time. What are you talking about? Everyone was happy in that panel. They got their questions answered, and everyone was really serious, and they, they were buying gear, and it, it all was, was a swimming success. went along swimmingly, and it was a great success. What are you talking about? It was great to see these people there, to... To, 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 to ask them questions and to find out, you know, what's going on in the industry. It was, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just talking about what's there. What was there? You and I attended something different. I mean, or your mind was somewhere else or you didn't see what I saw. And yeah, and then they'll accuse me of making it all up. I, make, I, I, I haven't said anything that didn't happen. They talked, they answered questions. They said, you know, there's no more internships, that, that, but getting to be an intern would be a good way to, to work your way up in the business. But by the way, there's, this is what's happened to our interns, and, and they didn't really make it. And so there were all these double messages for the people. And I, um, it was just like a writer's conference. I, went to, I know you want me to shut up, but I'm going to say this. I, I went to this writer's conference in Maui, and uh, it was just a big deal. And it was the Les Miserables all over again. This was like Les Miserables, right? You have the rabble of people all starving. They all want to be in the business. They all want to be somebody. They mix, they all mix, they have mixing boards, they all have, some of the people I met, you know, some of the um, people there attending had studios, had commercial studios, you know, like they, they were, uh, you know, were open for business. Like you could call them up, you know, they, they had like a secretary and, you know, a big, you know, like the studio here in Santa Fe, we have uh, Stepbridge Studios. We have two boot. We have two rooms, A and B, and then a control room, and then a vocal booth and other kinds of things there, and uh, a bunch of vintage rack gear that's kind of all neatly done. It's all designed well, nice lighting. You know, you know that kind of thing. You know, a, a typical commercial studio, and um, they have a, a client roster of all these famous people that, that record there, just like what you'd find in Nashville or you know anywhere else, and. Uh, and so a lot of these people attending had studios like that. But they hadn't really broken in. It's like I've met some guy that had a studio online, that, uh, a studio in Seattle. And he, he, you know, he, mainly, you know, he mainly cuts demos for people. There's never been a hit yet. No, another guy in Santa Barbara got a you know, class A, top of the line, the best mixing and studio and phenomenal masters comes out of, this, out of these people. And they go right to YouTube. You know, they're, they're not stupid like us. They go right to YouTube. And, um, you know, and they do, they do a pretty good job. And, and the sound is phenomenal. You know, it's just it's awesome. And uh, these people also design studios, you know, for, for big like Sony. And, you know. So we're talking about major talent, major, you know, no hits. So there was a lot of people just like that in attendance, and so maybe not on that level, but I mean, you know, who have, you know, the studio in Milwaukee or the studio down in Miami or the studio in, in Nashville or the studio, right? And they, they're serving the needs of the musicians of the community, right? You come in, just like if I went to Stepbridge here, if I was producing somebody that, that we needed to cut vocals, I'm not going to cut them here. We're going to go book time there. We're going to bring our, you know, our, our mix in and we're going to do our vocals you know, we're going to hire that studio to do our vocal, or the vocal of the band I'm producing or whatever, they're going to go down there and then I'm going to be behind the control room and we're going to, going to get the vocals done and then I'm going to come back here and we're going to mix it, you know, mix it in. 
and that's the way it, 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 it should be done. If it's, if it's like somebody going for like a record or for like a very serious demo, we're not going to mess around. We're going to, you know, we're going to use this studio for what we're, which is nonstop mixing and we're going to go down there and, and we're going to, you know, record anything we need to record in that environment, which is, you know, a pristine, you know, it's kind of sterile, uh, that means not any ambient sounds creeping in and around. In that kind of a room, that's where we'd have to go. Okay, so there was a lot of people there in attendance who basically had studios like that. So they were successful. They were successful and are successful. And, you know, um, and then to see them being talked down to was just, it was just uh, amazing. It's this man forming another secret society. It's like another club. So the, the bad feelings that are suppressed, because nobody knows what I'm talking about, so the bad feelings that are underneath fester, even if the people in the vessels don't know it's festering and fester, and they don't know it, but eventually, you know, it leads to, um, you know, discomfort and disease, and, and at the very least, it just leads to, to, to problems, like, you know, the, these, these hidden messages, like, you know, you're no good. You'll never make it. You're a loser. Your studio is insignificant and always will be. What you have to say on the internet is stupid. All of it is just useless. You're useless. You should just eat, you know what, and die. You should never have been born, actually. You're a black hole. You just suck life out. You contribute nothing. We contribute everything. We're the winners. But I wasn't trying to compete with you. I'm just like, you know, doing what I feel like doing. I'm not trying to compete with you. No, but you're a loser anyway, just for being in my presence. Because you see, I can't win unless you lose. I need for you to lose. I need you people in the audience to know that you're where you are and I'm where I am. I need that difference. Without that, we have nothing. And with that, we have what we have, don't we? Have a great time until I see you again. I, um, I gotta go, I got, uh, I got work to do. And I think in a way I've, I've kept talking to avoid some hard work I have to do. I, and I've gotta put all, all these, look, you know, with me, I mix because I like it. I like it. I do music because I like it. I don't care. Um, it, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing what I love and so there's no worries, understand? There's no like injustice or what, if, you know, I'm just kind of like whatever the next thing is and I got like four things right now so I'm really excited so I'm really stoked and that's, and that's where I'm at. You know, that's just, uh, you know, I'm sorry I'm happy. I really, I'm <laughs> being facetious. I'm sorry that it's all worked out for me. I'm sorry that it's, I'm really enjoying um, you know, what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I am sorry for the world, you know what I mean? And I'm praying for the world, but if the world needs me to be in a good, you know, solid, positive state so that I can do more good. I can do the praying. When I'm feeling sorry for myself, do I pray? No, not really. I try to get people to pray for me. That is a black hole situation. But when I'm positive, I, can, I want to affect people in a positive way. Just, just like I, I didn't want people to take this podcast the wrong way. It's not saying you suck. It's trying to heal. Heal. That's all I've been trying to do is heal. Amen.